I only became that effective teacher when my students quit on me. And in that way, I learned more from my students than they could ever learn from me. With luck, that will be the biggest cliche that I use today. But I do. I teach psychology. And I know, you know, it's not biology, it's not chemistry. I know the stereotypes of my field. Mine are the easy classes. Show up, get an A. It's not like those real classes that some jaded administrator specifically designs to separate the wheat from the chaff. And yes, I'm looking at you, organic chemistry. But I don't want to fit that mold. I know that psychology can be a rigorous science. I know that the skills that I have to teach to my students, like critical thinking and the ability to recognize bias in other people, are some of the most useful skills that a person can learn. Still, when <laughs> my primary assessment is, can you think critically? I have to admit that if they show up and put the effort in, they're probably going to do OK. Even so, my students were completely floundering. And it didn't actually surprise me that much. It shouldn't surprise you either. Because I'm not talking about some distant past here. I don't know how old I might look to you, but I'm actually still pretty new to this teaching thing. I'm talking about this semester when my students just came back from a year of virtual learning. If nothing else, I, I did appreciate their honesty. <sighs> I stopped class one particularly listless Tuesday afternoon and just asked them straight up, why aren't you doing anything? Five minute assignments just left unsubmitted and not a single word of notes written in a 50 minute class period. I felt like I had been setting them up for success, teeing up that perfect shot. Why would they just not even take a swing? <laughs> we didn't learn anything last year, their de facto spokesperson told me. And nobody cared. We just don't know how to do school anymore. Those were exact words. Like I said, I did appreciate their honesty. Until that point, I had been trying to teach a college class to college students like I had been. Not only was I raised in an upper middle class suburban family when most of my students were working 20 plus hours a week just to help make ends meet, but I wasn't trying to learn in this maelstrom of economic uncertainty and medical tragedy and social isolation. I was trying to teach college students who had a lifetime of support and preparation, getting them ready to learn with me, that's just not who they were. And so they quit. So what you see here is the end of a weeks-long project in which students in my developmental psychology class were tasked with raising their own virtual child. They had unquit on me at this point, and I will get to exactly how in just a bit. Now, this is not like your sex ed parenting simulation. There were no baby dolls, no eggs they had to protect for a week, no baby bumps. It was all online, and they were tasked with making some decisions. Do you let your virtual infant cry it out or soothe them in the middle of the night? Do you do anything at all? when your virtual teenager comes home smelling like virtual pot. Think of it like The Sims, but minus the house fires and woohoo. And if that joke means nothing to you, that's OK. Students never get my cultural references either. Because my students are high schoolers. I'm teaching a college class, but they're minors. <laughs> they have yet to be fully independent and are still trying to figure out their identity, grasping at whatever threads of intelligence they can get. In psychology, we know this as the identity versus role confusion crisis. In real life, we know this as angst, or maybe the snowflake generation, or maybe just existential dread. But this, <laughs> this was in response at the very end to a simple prompt. Now that you have learned 
some developmental psychology, and you have practiced these skills, what would you want to say to the people who raised you? What do you wish they did, or maybe didn't do? Let's take a look. Don't force your opinions and belief on your kids. Be proud of me instead of telling me what I could have done better. Tell me it's okay to be stressed. Now looking at this, do you think that I succeeded in teaching them developmental psychology? It's, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. I don't think I succeeded in doing that either. <laughs> that wasn't my goal at that point. When I was focusing on that at the exclusion of all else, that's when they quit on me. And to get engagement of this sort, and I mean engagement of their entire souls, I had to completely reframe the purpose of our time together. I never thought I would be proud of making my students cry, but that's what happened. Students cried as they wrote these words on the board. Some cried se just seated, telling me they had never felt as free as just being able to think these thoughts. That depth of catharsis only comes about from a pain that is just as deep. And I know that I saw more personal growth in that 10 minutes than I could have ever hoped for in a semester's worth of lesson plans or course learning objectives. To get that growth, I needed to completely make my teaching secondary. I had been hitting my head against a wall of their apathy. And at the same time, they had been hitting their heads against a wall of a school system eager to diagnose their academic problems before even recognizing their personal ones. But I know, I am a teacher, and I know how infuriating this message can be, because teachers can't just be teachers anymore. We need to be coaches, social workers, sometimes surrogate parents. It should come as no surprise that over the past 35 years, burnout has become a larger and larger factor as to why teachers just leave the profession. And that was before the pandemic, which is the last time I will mention COVID during this talk, I promise. But like it or not, I mean, teachers, they still have those standardized tests to prepare for. Current status of no child left behind notwithstanding, many teachers still see the specter of standardized test scores hanging like an ax over their heads. And I could, of course, wax poetic about the myriad different ways standardized scores rob teachers of their intellectual freedom, rob students of their intellectual curiosity, that would be a different talk. And if I want to stop hitting my head against an impenetrable wall, I will keep my head away from Congress. But I'm not here to talk, tell you how to stop that. I am here to tell you that our school systems are failing our students when they try and fit whatever fix they find into their existing structure. Because some administrators are recognizing this, and they say, yes, please, build this nurturing, positive environment and teach calculus. They're asking us to multitask. Remember, I'm trained as a neuroscientist and a psychologist. I know that with exceptions so rare they might as well be superhuman, multitasking doesn't exist. Not only do you fail to succeed in two tasks, you fail to meet the expectations of one. And if you're the kind of person who, I don't know, is scrolling through Facebook while also trying to listen to a quite delightful talk, thank you, you have just proven my point. But that's what schools are doing. When they don't dedicate a space for developing these human skills that finally allowed my students to unquit, they're just tacking it on to biology, civics, English. And in trying to do both, they fail to do either. I was only able to do this because I am given a delicious freedom that most teachers could only dream of. I'm given a one-page standardized course learning objectives that I have to hit, a textbook, and otherwise free reign. It's pretty awesome. And that allowed me to adjust my course. I completely redesigned it still technically called developmental psychology, but it's probably now more accurate to call it develop your positive psychology. And we're still learning the basics. We're learning how cognitive skills mature, 
as people grow up. We're learning how the foundations of relationships can change throughout childhood. We're learning how different parts of your identity can at times conflict with each other. But now all of these lessons are skills-based. And I wish that I was not triggering so many epiphanies. I wish a student hadn't told me that my class was the first time she recognized disordered eating behavior in herself. I wish a student hadn't told me that my class was the first time she saw a previous relationship as the abusive trap she so narrowly escaped. I wish a student hadn't told me that my class was the first time he realized being abused wasn't his fault. But I have heard all of those things. I've heard a lot more. Those are life skills. Schools do sometimes realize that it's important to teach those, but even when they teach life skills through family and consumer science or even home ec if you're old school, they kind of stick to the same stuff. Basic sewing, cooking, maybe how to balance an archaic checkbook. And even that is in short supply, given that only about a third of high schoolers get any such education. Let me ask you, is that all there is to adulting? Bake a French bread pizza, mend a pair of pants, and you're good to go. Of course not. How do you nurture a positive relationship? How do you leave one if it isn't healthy? It shouldn't surprise us that about one in five people experience relationship violence before they turn 18 when we just leave it up to them to figure it out. Now, this failure to teach them is precisely why so-called adulting classes are exploding in popularity in colleges and universities. But for every course that includes things like basic home maintenance or budgeting or relationship management in their syllabi, which is almost always for no credit, so don't worry about your tuition dollars, I also see this parallel flood of sardonic think pieces decrying millennials and Gen Z's ability to do anything. <laughs> After all, what sort of lazy self-entitled snowflake needs to be taught how to be an adult? Well, all of us. We are a species dependent on the social transmission of knowledge. And just as you shouldn't expect someone to pick up the intricacies of a credit score through osmosis, you shouldn't be able to expect somebody to identify red flags of a problematic relationship and engage in collaborative conflict resolution just by, what, picking it up? There's a word for these skills. The ability to recognize the influences on your emotions, the ability to regulate your emotions and behaviors, and the ability to Spur positive growth in yourself. OK, there are many words, because psychologists love making up their own vocabulary. But one way to describe this is socio-emotional intelligence. Just like scientific intelligence, there will be some kids who come by it naturally. There will be others that need a lot of help. Just like scientific intelligence, it is up to us, the adults in charge of their development, to make sure that they build those skills. So what do I want to see? Put me into the curriculum. Or, I guess more accurately, put my admittedly haphazard response to my incredible students into the foundational structure of the school system. If you want science, I can give you science. We know that pushing and fighting through stress and anxiety is counterproductive. Doing something like taking a 20-minute break will actually let you finish your task faster and to a higher degree of quality. And formal education is no different. Dedicating a 40-minute class to these human skills, emotional regulation, relationship development, will allow them to be more successful in their traditional classes. This is not feel-good woo-woo. Teachers see improve test scores when they incorporate socio-emotional learning into their classes. And not every teacher has the bandwidth or the comfort level 
or the freedom to do that, which is why it needs to be a standard feature, not a bonus option. And not all of you are teachers. You don't have to be. What you do have to be is aware that these skills need to be taught, not modeled, not implicitly assumed, but taught. And I'm sorry, I'm not even going to let you hide behind passive voice here. You need to teach it to your kids when they just had a fight with their friends, to your Sunday school class when they've been the victims or perpetrators of bullying, to your high school employee when they've shown up late for work one time too many. I don't have kids. I do have my students. And I didn't know what they needed until, unfortunately, they were forced to beg for it. Now, they may not remember Erickson or Piaget or Ainsworth in a month, but they will remember how to advocate for themselves. That's not even close to what my official job is, but I view that as a success. Because that is the foundation of a student who is ready to learn, and that is the genesis of an adult who is ready to live. 